Hello and welcome to GameSack. Today we're going to take a look at the launch lineup of six different game consoles. Now these are games that were available on day one and not released like a couple of weeks later or anything like that. It's really interesting to see the only games that were available for the early adopters of the time. And as to be expected, these are for the North American console launches since, well, I'm a North American. But hopefully everyone else will find it at least somewhat entertaining to see what we had at launch here. Anyway, enough rambling, let's start out with the Genesis. The Sega Genesis launched in select cities on August 14, 1989. This is a 16-bit console and promised to bring arcade quality games to the home. This was Sega's strategy to beat out the Nintendo Entertainment System and usher in a new era of gaming. The Genesis came packed in with a port of the arcade game Altered Beast. This game didn't exactly take the arcades by storm, but it was well enough known to be a good choice as a pack-in. In this one, you're a resurrected dude set out to rescue Zeus's daughter. Rest in peace, yeah right, not for you. Rise from your grave. Along the way, you kick double-headed wolves and power yourself up with spirit orbs. Power up! You eventually become a beast who is, in fact, altered. This is a short game that you can beat in about 15 minutes with some practice, but more importantly, it showed how close the Genesis could get to bringing the arcade experience home. Not only that, but it allowed for two players to play simultaneously, though you'd need to buy another controller. This wasn't necessarily the best launch game for the Genesis, but it was definitely the best one to pack in with the system. Welcome to your doom. Next, we have Alex Kidd in The Enchanted Castle. This is a game with tons of potential. According to the story, it seems to take place before the Miracle World game. There's a nice variety of areas, enemies, and other obstacles. Unfortunately, there's also Jonkin, which is the rock, paper, scissors minigame. You even need to do this in the shop in order to buy stuff, and we're talking absolutely anything you might want to buy. Every time. I almost always lose. This absolutely ruins what could have otherwise been a rather good game. Because honestly, everything else is pretty good. Then there's Last Battle. This is a Hakuto no Ken game in Japan. While they certainly censored the game's violence for us lucky North Americans, they didn't really seem to alter how any of the characters look. The controls are laid out just like Altered Beasts with the punches, kicks, and jumps. After each stage, you can also choose where to go next. This is an interesting game, if a bit slow and boring. My favorite thing about it has got to be the nonsensical dialogue. I wanted you to meet Elisa! Now you have the look of a hero. And I say that because Elisa is damn hot. You will be a hero if you can hook me up with her. This is like a much meatier Altered Beast without any of the Altered Beast. When Space Harrier 2 was announced, I was sure that it would be the first game I bought with my Genesis once it came out. But then I saw a screenshot in the game magazine and I was like, yeah, maybe not. Overall, it's a decent game, though it was clearly made in a hurry and with very little knowledge about the Genesis hardware itself. My main issue is that it's just so incredibly choppy. I like the simplistic music, but it's just not fitting for a Space Harrier game. At least the voice quality is good. Get ready! Another issue is that it's incredibly easy to earn extra lives. I was able to beat this one just as easily on the hardest difficulty as I was the easiest. Sega knew that the original Space Harrier was popular on the Master System, which is really probably the only reason that this exists. I would have much preferred if this had been released two years later. It would have been so much better. Super Thunder Blade is next, and I absolutely expected this one to be a disappointment. And it is. While it's based on the arcade game, it's actually its own game. This one gives you a break button to slow down and stop during flight, as well as mid-bosses. Gone are the opening overhead levels, but you still fight bosses in the overhead style. Your helicopter is slow to respawn, but you do get used to it after a while. In fact, this can even be somewhat enjoyable to play. 
but I could just never get over these awful graphics, even for the time. What particularly bothers me is how everything appears to be bouncing up and down as you fly through a stage, especially the buildings. Not only that, but the scenery is very sparse. The sound effects are loud and abrasive. However, I've got to admit that I really enjoy the music in this game, and I wish that more remixes and arrangements would be made of this stuff here. That would indeed make me smile. Thunder Force 2 was the first game that I decided to buy for my Genesis after I was done with Altered Beast. And boy, am I ever glad I did. This shooter alternates between top view and side view stages. While this would definitely be bested by its follow-up games, I loved this game at the time. I had never played anything quite like it. It was immensely challenging and fun for me. It still is. Not only that, but the music absolutely blew me away. At the time, I had never heard a video game with sound quality even approaching this good. This was also the first game I ever played that was in stereo. Even the voice quality is really good. Sure, the pronunciations may be bad, but the recording quality is excellent. Well, except for maybe that one. This is the best launch game for the Genesis, bar none. Last up is Tommy Lasorda Baseball. It also sports one of the best covers ever for a video game. How could you not want to buy this? Anyway, you've got to have at least one game that appeals to sports fans, I guess. This is basically a beefed up version of Reggie Jackson Baseball, which was on the Master System, and that's fine. It's a simple baseball game, but it's also very intuitive to play. I always liked how there were decent quality voices calling out the direction where the ball was hit. First baseman. Not only that, but this game has some extremely stupid music. I love it. Besides that, there really wasn't much going on with this title. Overall, the Genesis had a rather mundane launch lineup, with the exception of Thunder Force 2. First baseman. Oh. The Genesis's launch was okay, but was the Super Nintendo's launch lineup any better? Yeah, I'd say it was. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System was launched on August 23rd, 1991. Providing even more whiz-bang features than most other consoles, Nintendo released the redesigned Super Famicom in North America. Packed in with the system was, of course, Super Mario World. This is also known in Japan as Super Mario Bros. 4, but they dropped that subtitle here. Not sure why, but whatever, doesn't really matter. Initially, this game does not seem very impressive with its graphics and sound beyond the parallax scrolling. The thing is though, that it's a very tough game to put down with tons of different stages and many secrets to keep you busy. The game itself plays like an absolute dream. You'll soon forgive the wimpy lullaby meant for babies that plays during the title screen and instead bask in the awesomeness that's one of the best Mario games ever, if not the best. After you spend some time with it, you begin to realize how perfect the graphics, sound, and music are for the game. Come to think of it, it probably just wouldn't be right if they were different. Nintendo sold a ton of consoles by including this game. Next is Pilot Wings, which was often used to show off the system's Mode 7 capabilities. This was originally a demo called Dragonfly that they showed off at trade shows, but then they took that and developed it into the full Pilot Wings game. These days, it doesn't necessarily look like much, but it's very relaxing and enjoyable to play. The many different vehicles definitely add to the fun. I marveled at the scaling and rotation, which was revolutionary at the time. It really was. I think a lot of people may have dismissed this one, but I'm glad that I didn't. Some of the music reminds me of Sesame Street or something like that for some reason, but other than that, this was a good game to show off exactly what the console could do right out of the gate. Who 
who can forget F-Zero? I certainly couldn't, even if Nintendo would like us to. This is a really cool racing game which is set in the future. In fact, it's based on actual future events. This is another game that really showed off what the system could do. The gameplay is really fast and it feels like you're right on the track. This was like nothing I had ever played before in a racing game. Sure, there aren't any hills or valleys, everything is perfectly flat, but you'll quickly get over that once you experience just how fun this game is. I love the way the tracks are designed. For example, on the death wind tracks, the wind blows, but you can't see it. You'll only be able to feel it in the controls and it's quite convincing. These magnetic bars in Port Town will quickly teach you how to use the shoulder buttons. This game also has an outstanding soundtrack. Gradius 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 3 from Konami made it out for the launch as well. I didn't care for this one much back then because it didn't really show off what the Super Nintendo could do and I wanted to spend my money on games that did. There's slowdown everywhere and it didn't look anywhere near as impressive as the shooters on the Genesis. But when you sit down with it for a while, there is definitely a great game here. The music is outstanding, even if it wasn't that pseudo orchestra that I was hoping for at the time. The melodies are very well done. It's a fairly good arcade port overall. The final launch game was SimCity. Believe it or not, this here is the first time I'm ever even playing this game. Basically, you're building a city and you have to worry about connecting everything with power, roads, utilities, and whatnot. After messing with the controls for a few minutes just to get the hang of it, it definitely starts to get fun. I really enjoyed these parts of ActRaiser and this looks very similar, but just more complex. I didn't play it for very long today, but I think that this is one that I'll come back to for sure. Overall, the Super NES had a pretty damned impressive launch lineup, and it's no wonder the system started off extremely well. The Sega Master System was actually launched as the Sega System in September of 1986. One bundle included the Hang-On and Astro Warrior combo cartridge. This was known as the Sega Base System. The other bundle included a Sega Light Phaser Gun and the Hang-On Safari Hunt combo cartridge. This was known as the Sega Master System. No matter which version you got though, the console itself said Sega Master System on it. Hang-On was a port of the popular at the time arcade motorcycle racing game. It's a fairly decent port that doesn't try anything special. There are five stages to race through and you're only racing the clock. If you beat all five stages, you move to the next course, which is slightly tougher. There are eight courses in all before it loops you back to course one. I thought it was fun back then. Astro Warrior is an overhead shooter. Overall, it's kind of average. The movement of some of the enemies can seem erratic at times. The bosses aren't exactly sights to behold, but they can be pretty tough. Nothing in this game really is a sight to behold though. I do however think the music is cool, especially the boss music. This would later be released as a standalone cartridge for Master System owners. The Master System got the Hang On and Safari Hunt combo cartridge. Hang On is the same game here as it was with the base system, why wouldn't it be? But Safari Hunt takes advantage of the light phaser where you go hunting and shoot down tons of animals. You even get to shoot monkeys, which is pretty nice. Haha, <laughs> take that you stupid monkey. The light phaser is extremely comfortable to use and it works much better than Nintendo Zapper. I am not wrong on this. Oh, and yes, this is a much better game than Duck Hunt. You can't shoot any monkeys or even fish in Duck Hunt. Built into each Master System console from this time was a hidden game called Snail Maze that you had to access with a code. You guide a small snail through 12 different mazes within the time limit. 
I think it's pretty cool that Sega chose to sneak a little game into the console itself. Choplifter is a port of Sega's arcade game, which itself was based on the original computer version. This is a great version of the game, so much better than any of the computer ports. Again, I'm not wrong on that. You have to rescue twice as many hostages here per stage as you do in the arcade game. There are a total of three different stages, well actually four I guess. This was the first game that I ever consciously took notice of parallax scrolling and the effect blew my mind at the time. If I squinted hard enough, I could see the actual depth that the game provided. Thank you Choplifter for starting me on a lifelong obsession with parallax effects. The music annoyed my mom, but <laughs> that's okay because it didn't annoy me. This is a great game. Of course, Fantasy Zone had to be around for the launch. Guide the sentient ship around looping stages to destroy all of the bases and collect money. Then buy new weapons and stuff in the shop. It's a good game, but I just feel like I've talked way too much about it in my life at this point. Ghost House was released on the Sega card in North America. Wander around the mansion and collect the jewels and punch the monsters and bats. Get a key to unlock one of the five coffins to awaken Dracula. Defeat him to grab one of your family jewels. Defeat all five Draculas to go on to the next stage. This is my favorite card game from Sega and I still think it's really fun to play today. My Hero was another game on a Sega card based on their arcade game. Sadly, it's more annoying than fun. Your girlfriend gets kidnapped right out of your hands because you are not a very reliable boyfriend. So you set off to save her. You die in a single hit. That's fine, but it's really, really easy to get hit and also really frustrating. The music will likely also bother anyone who hears it after a while. Weirdly, I always want to try again when I die. Finally, we have Teddy Boy, also on the Sega card. This is a port of Sega's arcade game called Teddy Boy Blues. Basically, you run around the looping stages, shooting all the things and collecting all the little things that they turn into until they're gone. It's not a bad game at all, and it's probably the second best card game on the Master System. I'd certainly recommend this one in a heartbeat over My Hero, but it doesn't have a ton of lasting power unless you really don't have much else to play. The launch lineup of the Sega Master System seems laughable looking back on it, but there were actually some nice games here. Now, for one of the biggest console launches in history. Well, for the time anyway. But when the original PlayStation came out, it also came with a lot of games. The Sony PlayStation was launched in North America on September 9, 1995. This CD-based system came bundled with some demo discs, but no actual game software. You also needed to buy separate memory cards to even save your game in many titles. Man, remember those days? They really nickel and dimed us, and we were so stupid that we absolutely loved it. There were many games that were available on day one, and they all came in these oversized jewel cases that Sony quite literally purchased from Sega. First up is Total Eclipse Turbo. This one comes first because Dave and I actually bought our copies out of store a week or two before the console itself was even available. It was the very first PlayStation game available at retail. This is a port of the 3DO game called Total Eclipse from Crystal Dynamics. This port was handled by Beam Software and honestly, it's not as good as the 3DO version in any area, which is disappointing. It's basically a spaceship shooter where you fly forward and shoot things. Eventually, you travel through some tunnels for whatever reason. The gameplay has never been super tight in any of the versions, but this was certainly a sight to behold back when the 3DO was new. Oh man, it was awesome. By the time the PlayStation had come out, it was definitely less impressive compared to other PlayStation and Saturn games. Even the sound quality of the excellent music is worse than the 3DO version. You only get mono music here. 
Air Combat from Namco is next, which was renamed from Ace Combat in Japan, just like the arcade. This is an action flight game that I could never get much into, at least not this first one. I spend most of my time just trying to get the enemy in my sights, which isn't exactly a rip-roaring good time. Here's a tip though, don't obey the red arrows in the center of the HUD, you'll never get anything in your sights that way. The levels are largely empty, plain to look at, and long. At least the music is good though. Here we have Battle Arena Toshinden, and I bought this when I picked up my PlayStation on launch day. I had to have it because the magazines of the time praised it to no end. Well, it turns out that the magazines were wrong. This is not a good game, and it wasn't back then either. It's plagued by a bad camera that's often too lazy to recenter itself. The controls are also very slow to respond. But hey, it looked great for the time, and two or three of the music tracks were really good. Sadly, despite looking great, it was just nowhere near as fun as the original Virtua Fighter, which I had already been enjoying on the Saturn for several months by this point. I ended up selling this one a few months later. At least the sequels are a tad better. <laughs> ESPN Extreme Games from Sony was another one that I picked up at launch. It mainly appealed to me because the graphics looked similar to Road Rash on the 3DO, and I wanted more of that. This game lets you choose from a mountain bike, luge, roller skates, or a skateboard. You all race together, and I always choose the bike. Your main goal is to go through as many gates as possible on your way to the finish line. You can also battle your opponents during a race. Honestly, it doesn't play very well, and I've always had trouble finishing the race in a decent position. I liked the graphics for what they were at the time, but this one didn't see a lot of playtime compared to all of the other games I got for the console that day. Well, actually, I played it more than Battle Arena to Shinden, anyway. <laughs> Next is Kalik, the DNA Imperative. Is it Kalik, or is it Kiliak? I'm not sure, and honestly, I don't really care, but I've always called it Kalik. This one is a first-person corridor shooter where you play as a mech. The game is largely exploratory, and the map fills in itself as you wander around. I've never been tremendously interested in this game, and I can't even recall if I rented it back in the day. I probably did, but I didn't play it much. However, I can see how some people can get into it, as the exploration aspect is actually pretty cool. The graphics are minimal, but there are small sections that do contain a bit of color here and there. The music is foreboding and somewhat decent sometimes, but I don't care for the overall abrasive and loud sound effects. Oh, and this game won't even let you play it at all if you don't have a memory card or enough space on the memory card if you do have one. This game doesn't care about your wallet, now you go out and get a memory card right now, you cheap ass. Repair parts secured. Cartridge secured. Then there's NBA Jam Tournament Edition from Acclaim. I've always enjoyed this game for a few minutes here and there, but I do get bored just going back and forth over and over after a short while. I usually turn the game off after a single quarter. The announcer helps keep it exciting though. Fancy move! Of course, I always play as the Nuggets since they're the only basketball team I know, and I'm only slightly familiar with one of the players represented in this game. For sure though, it definitely plays well here. It supports four players simultaneously if you have a multi-tap. In the single player game, you can only control one player instead of whoever has the ball, which is kind of a bummer. I couldn't tell you if it's the definitive version of the game or not, but it's mostly good enough for me. Next is Power Serve 3D Tennis from Ocean. Okay, I've got a question for you. Are you looking for an absolutely fantastic game of video tennis? 
Well then look elsewhere, because this game is horrendous. The camera views make it nearly impossible to play. I mean, just look at this. You can switch views, but even with this view, the gameplay is very slow and laggy. I'm 100% certain that this was the lowest selling game in the PlayStation's launch lineup, and it absolutely deserves that dishonor. There's no power to serve you here if you bought this one. Love, 13. The Raiden Project is yet another game that I picked up on day one. This one puts Raiden 1 and Raiden 2 on a single disc. This kind of wizardry is achieved by the storage capacity of the compact disc, which is virtually limitless. I tell you, I played this disc quite a bit. Both games on here are fantastic, and they have a lot of options for you to mess with. Not only that, but there's some really cool arranged music for both games that you can enable if you like. And believe me, I like. This is one save file that I never deleted, so all of my old scores are still here. Can you beat my height score in Raiden? How about in Raiden 2? <laughs> I bet you can't. Well, unless you can, that is. You can even enable a TAME! Well, kind of. The screen gets rotated like you'd expect, but Sony really doesn't want you to tilt your TV on its side because it absolutely will get damaged, according to them. So it plays like a horizontal shooter and there's no option to correct the controls for this mode. I had a lot of fun with this disc and I still do every time I spin it up. The original Rayman was still another purchase that I got with the console. I had hoped to get it on the Saturn, but hey, it came out first for the PlayStation, so they got my money. This game originally appeared on the Atari Jaguar. Sorry, Jaguar. I know a lot of Brits get triggered the way Americans say that word because I guess they have nothing else going on with their lives. Anyway, this one adds even a bit more color and, of course, CD music. It's a fun 2D platformer for a while, but it can be quite a difficult game earlier than you expect it to be. You gain powers gradually during your adventure to help you gain access to areas you couldn't before. Your main goal is to find and reach the exit, but you can also rescue up to six of the caged critters in each stage. The lush visuals, fun characters, and music are the standout features here, though the music tracks are extremely short and loop quite a bit. As a game, well, you've already played many better ones on the 8 and 16-bit consoles. The last game that I got on day one was Ridge Racer! I must have been saving for quite a while back then to get all of these games on day one. Anyway, this quirky racer from Namco was definitely a must-have back then. It promised to be way better than Daytona on the Saturn. Well, yes and no. It doesn't have the graphical issues that Daytona did, but the gameplay isn't quite as good here. Still though, don't get me wrong, it's a fantastic game. The main issue is that you only have one track with an extension. The entire game loads only once, so overall it's tiny. You can pop the CD out after it loads and put your own in, but I really enjoy the crazy energetic music that comes with the game that would be a staple of the series. I also love the announcer, as he kind of reminds me of the lead singer from the B-52s for some reason. Great job! I got everything on camera, so you'll watch it later, huh? You're the greatest! Oh yeah, I'm the greatest! This was a great start to an awesome series and also a wonderful introduction to see what the PlayStation console was all about. final launch game for the PlayStation is Street Fighter the movie The Game from Acclaim. I guess Capcom was too embarrassed to release it themselves. Honestly though, it's not a badly playing game at all. It's much better than the arcade game of the same name. It plays like Super Street Fighter 2 in a lot of ways. The worst thing about it is probably the ugly digitized visuals. It looks like Street Fighter meets Mortal Kombat and not in a good way. Still, it's a competent fighting game for sure. Even the music isn't bad. I like how one of the tracks starts out with sounds quite literally ripped off from the original Star Trek show. Round one, fight! 
<laughs> Don't write this game off too quickly, it's better than you might think. I think it's safe to say that the PlayStation had an incredible launch lineup. I know that I had tons of fun that day and in the weeks that followed. <laughs> Okay, only two more consoles to go in this episode. When the Nintendo 64 launched, I always thought it was kind of sad because there were only two games available. Good thing they were both pretty awesome. The Nintendo 64 was unleashed upon North America on September 29th, 1996 with twice as many bits as its competitors. That makes the console twice as good, right? Damn straight it does. Actually, it doesn't. The game that everyone had to have was Super Mario 64. This one wasn't bundled in with the console after Nintendo saw how successful the PlayStation was without a bundled game, but that helped keep the cost of the system down and everyone would just buy the game anyway. And buy it they did. This one sold at a near one-to-one -one ratio with the console itself back when it came out. Rightfully so, as this one was completely revolutionary back when it was released. Mario is now operating in a fully 3D environment and can do many different things in each area in order to collect all of the stars. Sure, the camera may seem a bit primitive these days, as do some of the other aspects of the game, but back then, this was all perfectly fine. If you were around back when the Nintendo 64 launched, then you realize how amazing this game is. And if you picked up a Nintendo 64, you also picked up this game. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Next is Pilot Wings 64, which was developed by Paradigm Simulation under Nintendo's guidance. This plays much like the original Pilot Wings, with you leisurely taking flight tests on an island. This one adds a lot of creative stuff, and it's definitely a fun game, at least for me. It can be a bit finicky to control sometimes, and as a result, it can be a touch frustrating. And that was it. Those are the only two games released at launch for the Nintendo 64. Pilot Wings probably wouldn't have sold as well if the console had more games out at the time. I still don't think that you should overlook this one though. This would be the last time that a Nintendo system launched with a Mario or Pilot Wings title, ever. At least until the next time that they did, which was on the DS and 3DS respectively. The Nintendo 64 didn't have the best launch lineup, but you know, it really didn't need it. Bust out your testosterone because the last system we're looking at today is the Neo Geo AES. The Neo Geo is a 16-bit arcade machine that promised the exact same games at home because the home system has the exact same hardware. The console itself retailed for about 500 US dollars and each individual game cost between 200 and 250 dollars. Did I say 500 dollars? Because I actually meant 650 dollars if you got the gold system. And that's in 1991 dollars. That is way north of a thousand dollars in today's money. The home AES system launched with five games in July of 1991. Magician Lord was the one that everyone wanted to play. The screenshots in the magazine look fantastic, and that first stage really draws you in with impressive visuals and music. The game itself really isn't that great, but come on, we didn't know any better back then. This was an arcade game that we were playing at home. It even had an intro which wasn't in the arcade, so it's even more powerful. Suck on it, MVS owners. Your system is too weak and underpowered to handle this intro. Pathetic. They also made the home version much more difficult, as you now have checkpoints you respawn at. The first couple of stages are fun, but it gets rather repetitious and maze-like in the second half of the game. Still, the first two stages here are always a blast for me to play. This was a must-have for every Neo Geo owner, and you could get it bundled if you bought it with a Neo Geo Gold system. A different game you could get bundled with the Neo Geo Gold system was NOM 1975, which would also be considered a must-have. You're sent back to Vietnam to rescue Dr. Muckley, and I'm guessing this probably takes place in 1975? Yeah, the graphics definitely make everything look like 1975. The designers played some Cabal and watched some Full Metal Jacket as they were coming up with ideas for this one. It takes a bit of getting used to since the buttons on the Neo Geo joystick are so far apart, but you'll eventually get the hang of it. 
You can shoot and you stand still while you do so. You can lob grenades if you have any and holding the C button lets you run. You can also somersault to avoid enemy fire. There's lots of voices in this game, but it's all very poorly recorded with what's known as plosives. You know, plosives. This is Firebird. Headquarters. Over. We've been sighted. Still though, this is a great game. Unlimited Continues will let you walk right through it though, so try not to tempt yourself. New operations have been watched. Then there's Baseball Stars Professional. This was my favorite baseball game ever for quite some time. When this was released, almost everything about it blew me away. The intro was just fantastic with scaling and real voice. Dynamic! Speaking of voice, there is a ton of speech in here, which was a big selling point of the Neo Geo, and this game delivered it in spades. Take your base. The pitcher walks him. It's the same guy from Nam 1975, but his voice was recorded much better here, and he's very excited to be announcing the game. And I'm excited to play this. Even if you don't like baseball, there's still a good chance that you'll enjoy this game since it's so fast paced and easy to control like an arcade game should be. Get the homer out of here. And as he rounds the bases, he loves to egg that crowd on. And proud he should be. He hit that ball a country mile. He just loves to hit homers here in this park. Next, we have Cyberlip. This is a run and gun, kind of a progenitor to the Metal Slug series on the system. This one features lots of voice as well. Hurry to Colony CO5, where the computer is, and wait for further orders. Once again, it's the same guy as the last two games. His name is Michael Beard, and his existence should be celebrated by all. You can only shoot left, right, and up, which feels a touch limiting at first. You can also nab some cool power-ups as you blow up the military androids. The first couple of stages are really cool, but I feel that the game loses some serious steam after that and becomes a touch boring. Sometimes you can choose which way you want to go, and if you choose poorly, you can end up playing a long level that you've already finished. This only exacerbates the boredom. Still, those first two levels are once again really fun. This is another one you can walk right through with unlimited continues if you're not careful. Finally, we have Top Players Golf, which was the largest game on the Neo Geo for a while, clocking in at 62 mega power! Sadly, this isn't a great game at all. Well, there's lots of voice in here, which is cool, I guess. Now, the game is starting. Put the ball on the green in two if you drive straight on this hole. Good birdie champ. And there's some fairly decent scaling of the course when you hit the ball. But actually playing this game sucks the big one because your shot meter moves insanely fast. I've never been able to control it well, no matter which character I pick. It's almost impossible to make a short putt, even when you hammer the button as fast as you can. The Neo Geo has some definite classics, which I weirdly love in its launch lineup, but much better games would come soon. Green slopes, downhill to the left. Well, there you go, a bunch of different launch games for a bunch of different consoles. Obviously, my favorite launch from this batch was the PlayStation because, you know, I bought a lot of games for it. Anyway, what was your favorite console launch and what was your favorite game at the time? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Are you incredibly bored and have no friends? Where the hell did that camera come from? Try the new personality booster. Holy crap, the lens just changed spontaneously! Now available in easily chewable tablets. Where the hell did it go? Well, now suddenly over here, how the hell did that happen? Just pop one tablet per hour and grow a brand new fun personality. That's a nice looking camera too. It's got wires and a bunch of stuff attached to it. Are you spying on me? 
With a new personality, suddenly people will want to hang out with you. Oh, you thought you could hide up there, huh? Well, guess what? You got a big old tripod that takes up a lot of floor space. I'm gonna get you. So enjoy all life has to offer by popping our tablets. Where do you think you're going? You get back here right now! What the? Try the new personality booster tablets today! You come here right now, you teleporting camera demon! What? It's a 